meeting to order. It looks like it's uh, 10 07. And uh, we'll ask for the agenda to be adopted. Are there any additions to the agenda? I have a couple to add um, under new business uh, 7.2, um, a G3 tour. And 7.3, talk, ask, listen, the seminar. Are there any other? If not, I'll ask them. Senator Stolberg, I got another question. Yes. Or it is. Um, when it comes to our approvals of our gravel pits, is that a council item from environment, or is that an ASB item, or is it both, and we should discuss it on both? Actually, should be an MPC item because an MPC. It's a development permit. Okay, but who? Yeah, who, but who, and it, it, those are done at the MPC level typically, unless there is a um, crossover to a stop work order, which then brings in to council. Okay. Ag service board. The only really I think we deal with it is you guys get to do the cleanup. You get to do the weekend. <laughs> okay, I just I they they get it ready and. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hear me? yeah, we can, Dave. Yeah, no. Uh, Quentin and them get it ready. And then, it, and then they come down and they expect, inspect them. And that, that's how it has worked before. And we haven't had one that we had that got approved yet. Well, that's wrong. That's wrong. Quentin and okay. them that do the week patrol right. and get them. Get it? Are you talking about the get reclaimed? No, the old bits for the rec for the full rex on them. The okay, the reclamation the is done the then, yes. under the, under what? Yes, yes, the reclamation is typically done because you look after pretty much all the. Yeah, no, I, so I'd like that. It just so we can have a bit of a discussion on what our next steps are. Yeah, we'll put that as seven point. Got too many gravel pits four. on there. Seven point four less. Yeah, that'll be the the gravel pit reclamation. Okay. Are there any others? No, and I'll ask for a mover for the agenda. Uh, I'll move the agenda. Clark. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Okay, being we have I guess today, I think we'll go through introductions now. Um, we'll start uh, with Quentin, please, and we'll go this way. Quentin Wollock, Manager of Egg Health Services. Derek Kushner, Manager of Information Services. Larry Clark, board member. Ernie Gender, board member. Dave Grover, board member. Stevens, Stevens, board member. Les Stilberg, board chair. Uh, James Nyberg, board member. And in the back row. Uh, Kelly Jackson, with the agriculture, forestry, and Rural Economic Development. <laughs> okay. And uh, your Central Regional Liaison Representative. Glad to be here. Perfect. Welcome. Okay, now we'll move into adoption of minutes from the December 9th, um, 2021 ASB meeting. Did everyone get a chance to uh, read the minutes? Any other mover? Mr. Stevens moves. All in favor? Carry. Favor. Okay. Reports. Um, 5.1, the uh, ASB report administration. Clinton? Okay. That's on page three. So, uh, start off with strict on a little update. <clears throat> we sold a few cases yesterday. I'm down to six. 58 cases left on hand with what four days left to sell um, there's a chance we're gonna have some that I'll have to use on our land so we're gonna have to possibly revisit the budget in May when we do the when we set the mill rate to absorb I estimated on 73 cases that was $27,000, so we'll be down a bit from that, but egg services may have to eat based on even 50 cases. Okay. Have you
you had any requests for other municipalities asking for it to be transferred over? Or? Uh, Wayne Wright said if, if we've got some, they'd take some. Days and and Dan Rose as well. So if it's some, if you want me to off, if sell off to another county some, I can. But that is now if I eat 50 cases, I'm looking at eating $15,000. Mr. Clark, uh, how many cases are allowing people to buy? Still so just two or? It's two per purchase, but they can come back in a second time. The, Why? The, but nobody is repeating their, their business besides one person this week. I still have the rule in place that it's your five year average plus one case. <clears throat> it's what you're allowed, that's what I taught the ODA with discretion, but I don't have very many repeat customers right now. It's all coming for two cases. I know you're going to have another three go, so I can guarantee you that. Mr. Grover, did you have something to add? Maybe not. Anyone else? Yeah, I thought you could talk to it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, the, you know, you got guys with 25 quarters a lot and uh, we did had, uh, I'm not going to be a complainer, but we've had some problems with the time and they were supposed to be there uh, last one case, one 10 cases, Quentin. I didn't hear you very well. There's times of what, sorry? Rather than, rather than you say we have to eat it or we have to use the donor on that. Okay. Would you use out more than the two cases? Because I had I've been asked that twice now, and the one guy will they, they, they'll just get it. They'll use it on their own land, but he rolls twenty six or seven quarters. Hello. I'll leave that up to the board to decide. It's that was a rule put in place by Albert Agriculture Culture years ago. It was maximum two cases, but being that we're down to the but last. But now we now we got 50 cases that we need left to sell, so we sell five to one guy and ten to another. Why would we not do that rather than eat it or whatever you were saying? With discretion, because if if Mr. Stevens comes in for five cases, I'm going to deny it. He's only got 15 acres. But yeah, with discretion, I agree with that. The guy I'm talking about, I think they farm 25 or 24 quarters. Uh, and then you got Mr. Eline there. I think he's 43 quarters. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Eline's only bought two five, cases. Once. Five, ten, four, five, ten cases is not really a whole pile. Besides the county, when I did the gopher poisoning for the county there, because they had a problem in that berm, and I rent the land beside it, we ended up having to put 33 uh, bottles on, on that 190 acres. But we haven't had a gopher problem since there. That, that eliminated the problem. And before, uh, the ground just crawled with them there. So, and that's on 190 acres to clean it up. Uh, now it's clean. Uh, we filled out some of the badger holes and stuff. And uh, now we're back growing grass on it. Uh, so, I think two cases per guy, per guys that own sections of land, is a little is not right. If you would, uh, that'll be up to the board. If they would today at this meeting would to make a decision to sell more cases than that, I know guys and they got it under lock and key too. Okay. So the rule is you can come in on Tuesday and buy two cases. You come back on Thursday and buy two cases. And I'm not having anybody do that. No, nope. I've had one person I think this year who is coming back a second time, and I think I have about four last year come back for a second purchase. It's all one-time oh, yeah. users, but. I see. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nybert? So when you say that we're going to eat them, is the expiry date goes on, or what are we talking about? Yeah, sell it. So Health Canada has put a, is, is making strict nine prohibited use in 2023, as of March 4, 2023. So if you remember, at March 4 of 2021, I could not buy any more to sell to you. March 4 of 2022, I cannot sell you anymore. And March 4 of 2023, 
you can't use it anymore for the control of Richards and Ground Squirrel. So it will be a prohibited item, not for sale, one year from March 4th. And how many do we typically use ourselves? We don't. Okay, so we never used any ourselves on our land. So have we got this out on our um, social media that this is coming? I mean, the average the average farmer is probably got more concerned about whether he's uh, hauling in his barley in or his cannoli in right now more than he is worried about whether there's a gopher. Because I've been outside yesterday and it didn't look like there's too many gophers going to be around. So um, I think we need to do a hard social media alert to get out there that this is happening. I think once we do that, I'm with Dave and with um, Mr. Clark. I think we will have the. You could probably pretty much just set up a, a booth at the at the shop and be ready to go because once people realize this is happening, they're going to be in. They'll be like gophers. They'll be everywhere. We advertise the heck out of this, right? For the last. Yeah, and it's on our web page, and we've hit every paper and. And that guy, our web page sucks. I'm sorry. I don't yeah, care. Tell me that. Um, but I mean, it's out there. It's on Facebook. It, I mean, Nikki's done a good job with getting it out there. We had a guy in last week that wanted two cases, and he said, "Oh yeah, I read your, I read your post, and you know, if I don't get it before the end of the month, I'll be too late." So people, it's resonating with people. They're just procrastinating. Okay, and but you know, I'll, that, I'm going to tell you as, as an average person. Yeah. I follow the county website or the Facebook, and I haven't yeah. seen it, and I haven't um, reshared it. So that doesn't say much because I'm not a Facebook guy, but it's I'm going to I'll go on there today, and I will reshare that if it's on there. I, I guarantee you. Okay, I'll check. But I, we did a blitz. I know it's in the paper. I read it in the paper myself last week. Who reads the paper other than you? <laughs> it was, though. It was in both the papers, and it was on our Facebook or social media because I know sh I shared it on by more and Dan Bolton um, and but anyways um, Quentin you had something to add um, part of that ad says that it's Tuesdays and Thursdays for pickup between 9 and 12 but when they phone in the girls upstairs that that do the paperwork or the, the, the money transfer part I've told them that as long as I'm out here text me make sure I'm around but Heck, I, I delivered eight cases at three o'clock yesterday, right? So it says by appointment only, and it's restricted the hours, but I'm selling whenever. If it works for me, if I'm there, I'm selling it. I'm, pour, I'm trying to push it as fast as I can because I don't want to sit on any. I don't want to have any that I have to use. We don't use it on our county lands. We were allowed to. It's, it's zoned agriculture, but that... In the past, that's always been up to the renter. If you want to control gophers to graze the land, by all means, buy a strict I mean, put it on that land. It's it's my way out. If I end up having cases left over, that's my way out instead of burning it or just destroying it. I can put it on the county lands because we're landowners and it's egg, it's uh, zone A. So that's just my way out. It's still going to cost us because I can't resell it. I want to talk. Now go ahead, Dave. Uh, I think we should sell it. <clears throat> you have to prove the selling and all that, but we have staff there that can take them out and, and give them to the ratepayers. I think we should open it up and sell it. Uh, how often are you supposed to be at work? You know, you start at what? Uh, seven, you start at 8 o'clock and you're there until 4, right, Quentin? I'm there, I'm, where, I'm there well before 7. Well, then that's when we're going to sell it. And uh, as long as they give you your visa or whatever, uh, or, or you'll take a check right to. Yeah, I'm cash. You always cash is king. Cash is king. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear that. Cash, check, or visa? Right, Brent? Right? And just go ahead. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you so these guys come in like they're farming together with a kid, but the kid's got ten quarters, he's got he's got fifteen, or he's got two. What difference does it make to us when we're selling that gopher poison? I just told you how much we put on that 
And also, I took the ones out of that mound in the county office, but I haven't got a check from the county for what I did for them yet. Got rid of their gopher population, so they weren't eating around the trees and stuff. But uh, no, I, I think we should sell it. If they go in there, if we have staff there, we have, you, you still have staff in the building, and they should just take it out if they've been paid for and they're approved and Clinton's approved it. Why wouldn't we sell it for the eight hours? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm done. Mr. Gender, how many cases do we have, Quinn? As of yesterday, 58. Okay. I just texted one guy, he said two or more. So I think if we could do a little bit of phoning. Dave, if you know a lot of people down there, I think you could be doing a lot of phoning around with your neighbors down there, say this is your last chance. That's what I'm doing. As okay. soon as the uh, meeting's over. Yeah, that was my suggestion too. We Our board represents the entire county, so I think if we... The onus is, yep. is on us now to put the word out in our own communities. Yeah. That's it. But I think, but I think Glastry should have it so that if they show up there, they don't have a doctor's appointment till two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon. That's when they should get their put by there and grab the gopher poison. And I think Quentin did say, it, "What the hell's the difference?" Yeah, no, Quentin did say in this final week that he will yeah. accommodate everyone as best he can. It won't have to be. That's wonderful. Year. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Uh, quick question. The municipalities, you mentioned Wainwright and Camrose reached out to you. Is that for sale that they wanted some or for their own personal use? No, it'll be to sell to their reviews. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to know if the option was open if they used 10 we cases a year. Municipalities don't use it on their own things. Yeah. We bring it in for producers to use. Yeah. No, oh, fair enough. One, one other thing. Uh, that yeah, the uh, yeah, painters, caster, they opened it up, they let them buy whatever. They've been out of poison for oh, when I last talked to them, that would be three and a half months ago. They've been out of poison, okay. uh, we, but they opened it up. Guys could buy whatever they wanted to buy, and the shelf just cleared up, and that was the end of it. Yeah, we so had a, I don't know, we had a, a two, two, two per person. Thank yeah. you. We had a fairly healthy supply here, and the way I understand it, I don't think we had people beating down the door for multiple cases. Like, we were we re, we started selling again in September, and I didn't sell my first case till mid November sometime. I only sold like eight cases last year after we made that break, so they wouldn't use it in the summer. I I just don't think people are um, kind of getting off their butts and, and paying attention here. But. Well, I guess that's our council's job or our board member's job. Yeah, okay. I think that point's been taken. And uh, Thank you. If there's anything else on strict nine, we'll move on to anything else in your report. Um, that's pretty well it. I'll just... Leave it at that. The Egg Service Board bursary is open until April 15th. And uh, workshops, I was part of a, the Buffalo Lake Patriot Club. I didn't know that was a thing. They emailed me asking if I wanted to be, if I wanted to listen in to their Norway RAP program. And I was like, oh, interesting. I'm the inspector. Maybe I should listen to what you guys got going on. And then I came up. A speaker with uh, Karen Wickerson, who is our provincial rat specialist. I didn't know if that was because they had sightings or just curiosity, but okay. anyways, they're always looking for speakers. Yeah, they have some interesting topics. It's actually a cool club if you ever go to it. This next month is uh, talking about ants. There's 93 different species of ants in Alberta, and they're going to talk about it. Some possibly. That's my report. All right. There's no further questions. Can I get a mover for the report? I'll move it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Grover. All in favor? Carry. Here. Okay. Business arising from the minutes 6.1, the fence line spray program. Okay. So I think email's up and going. I can email Jared some pictures if you want to see them, but. Um, basically, what I've done here is try to explain the equipment we have uh, available for the fence line spray program. 
Um, in short, we've got a 150 gallon skid that goes in the box of your truck. We've got a 400 gallon trailer that pulls behind a tractor. Um, both designed for rough terrain. <clears throat> got the side by side with a 75 gallon tank, again designed for rough terrain. And we've got our skid mount brush sprayer, which is just a handgun unit with a 400 gallon tank that we can go off road with for brush spraying along fence lines. And then there's the two roadside spray trucks. Um, that putting further thought into it may not work as well because they're GPS driven to run the pumps. So before the pump kicks in and you get a good spray pattern, you got to drive 10 to 12 kilometers an hour. Might be a little rough on on uh, <laughs> on a fence line, um, but it you know the options there. Uh, I was asked to bring back the price, so five thousand. The unique number, $5,678, provides another 100 liter pod, like a tank for the chemical, the chemical pump, and all the wiring harness to go into the existing controls in the truck. So we just have to come up with a, I just have to get my welder to weld me up a mount and then install into everything else that's already existing. Mr. Oh, that's yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Larry Clark's on next, and then you, Dave. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to talk after Larry. Uh, thanks. Okay, on this, I was I, we went through this numerous times. We talked about these other s ways of spraying fence lines, and when, then we talked about the fact that if that truck could make another pass down the road, not inside the fence, that we would, if we had a second use, it, then it was stated that we could not use the the chemical we were using in the ditch because it was rated as either commercial or um, that it wasn't agriculture. So that's when we talked about this other pod and said to put another pod in the truck to spray it when you're there so that it saves us shipping somebody else down. So I was under the understanding this equipment was going on a truck and the, after our last conversation so that we could do it so that we could charge that chemical back to that landowner when they have a hold harmless agreement. We went through the whole hold harmless agreements. We went through all that piece before. So that was the thought, and also we were talking about three grand then, so we're, it's going up substantially. It's so going up quite a bit. Yeah, at the point where we were talking, it was understood it was a three thousand dollar tab, and then we also referred back to our additional taxes from our landowners. So um, this is not a, to me. This is not a discussion whether we go back there with a quad or we go with a bobcat sprayer or a truck sprayer. It was that we had had the, our trucks down there. And we could do it when we were there. We could spray over top of the fence line. And if the landowner was good with it, it protects our roads, it protects the fence. There may be the odd tree grows up if it doesn't get behind the post. Well, he can go along with the chainsaw after and cut that down. That's what I understood. So I was quite, I'm quite surprised it's even coming up again. I was under this understanding it was still in one track. I don't minutes up, but it was, I was to bring it back. Yeah. No, oh, I, I thought it would have been I was quite astounded with the price increase when I got it re-quoted, but yeah. Whether it's shipping or COVID or whatever, it went up just about double, not quite. So this would be a council discussion if you're still comfortable with the increased amount. Yeah, well, really, it's it's five thousand six hundred dollars. Shouldn't even be a council discussion, really. No, it's a budget down here it's because this is part of our budget. Yeah, we all okay. Yeah. Yeah. If it's inside the budget, I, I did put it in. Uh, I didn't put quite that much in, but I have enough to cover it. Okay. okay. So. But it is when we're there, we do it. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I, I, if I, Whatever felt... I can reach from the road, I reach, right? Yeah. Put a little extra stick in another hose and booster mm -hmm. belt. Right. Not the pump maxed out, but mm -hmm. still, we can do put some air compressor on some extra 100 psi. That'll get it out there. And then the other part, too, was um, that we were just doing one truck this year because there's discussions we'll bring up in for next year's budget that. One truck will be up for replacement. Mm -hmm. At that time, we can budget in three pumps or three uh, pods if that's the way you want to go. Yeah, if the retro and the other truck, be a good, good kind of yeah. pilot project, I guess. If we do one truck, to see how well it goes. Yeah. So, Dave, yeah, Dave, did you have anything further to add? Yeah, my rate right there down here south of me. I 
south to the county line there, you're getting a long way to better. They would appreciate, uh, they'll say, Dave Webster and a whole bunch of those said they'll sign their whole harmless agreement. That's not a problem for spraying over the fence while you're there. And the truck's still going to be on the road, so I don't know how what the difference. We're not going in the ditch to spray. If, it, if it's past where we can reach, that's fine. But I thought this pod was supposed to be put on there at 33000 or 3200 So I'll make the motion, if we have the money in there, to get this pod put on in the, in the winter here when we have a little bit of spare time. I would hate to see us stop brain to put this spot on in the summertime. I'd like to see it done right away. And I'll make the motion to spend the other, because actually this board is a standalone board, but uh, you can get uh, approval through council if you want. But if it's in our budget, we should be able to do it, and I'll make that motion. Okay, yeah, as long as it's Thank within you. budget. Okay, and for further discussion, Mr. Jenner? What distance can you spray with the Maximum. You got about fifty one to fifty four feet. The road's only sixty five, sixty six feet long wide. Well, we've got some ninety nine stuff, so that'll those are one offs, though, right? But yeah, they're one offs, but we haven't got very many of them. <clears throat> Not in my area, you know. And it depends on the wind, right? But that's kind of where I'm at. Going on the numbers we did last year, 17 meters is 51 feet. So that's kind of where I'm at. You're looking at least 35 feet from the shoulder of the road to the fence line. So you've got to, but like you said, it depends on, on any wind conditions too. That should do it. Is there any further discussion? Yes, motion does. I'll call in favor. All in question, all in favor? In favor. And that's scary. Okay, moving on to the new business. We have um, an orientation today presented by Kelly Jackson. And I'll ask Quentin to give a little intro for Kelly. Well, as she said, uh, Kelly is our, what used to be known as a key contact. She's, a, I guess it's called liaison for our region. So there's 14 municipalities in our region that she kind of, I guess, keeps in contact. Yeah, that's yeah, liaison. So Kelly's here today. She will do a bit of an orientation with you guys to kind of bring you up to speed on the acts we follow, uh, the tasks at hand, what, what we're supposed to do as a board, those sorts of things. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, having uh, me here today. I'm really happy that I can actually come in person. We've been doing some of these virtually, and I'll have to admit the ones in person are a little bit better, a little more interactive. So I would ask that if you have a question over anything I'm going through at that time, just ask away, okay? And if there's something that comes up after, that's great. So. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the orientation is basically uh, just to go over kind of why the history of why we even have ag service boards, the roles, uh, the legislation that ag service boards uh, deal with, what's the role um, when you're on the board, of course, you know, what our, your, your fieldman does in, in support of all of that, uh, the provincial committee, <laughs> And then we'll dive into a little bit about what the actual Ag Service Board program entails and what the ASB grant supports. Next slide. So when you look back in time, so back in the you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, there were a lot of things that were happening weather-wise in the province as well as um, things that were happening with settlement and the progression of agriculture. And the, uh, initially at the time, it was being dealt with at a provincial level, but there was so much variability um, you know, in the different areas of the province that it really um, 
it was proposed that there was a better way of doing that, and that was about um, you know in the in looking at it in the regions. So you're having a higher demand for you know grains and food and all of the things that come with agriculture, and yet we're you know not having the capacity to really tailor any response to growth and to um, adverse weather events, you know, to support agriculture. Next slide. So we have a lot of land and we have a lot of regions in uh, the country. So when you look at having, you know, a total land area of over 158 million acres and, you know, about 52 million of those are farmed, and you look at the north to south, east to west uh, range, that really um, speaks to when we have a third of the province that is farmed. So that really sets the stage for why having um, a centralized approach to agriculture just isn't the most efficient, nor is it the most effective. Next slide. So there was a, a pilot project um, that was proposed, and that happened in the early 40s, 1943. And so this uh, purpose was to see if they could find more effective ways to deal with the weeds and with soil uh, issues. So that was a project between Red Deer County and what is now Rocky View County, which was at that time Conrad. So um, there was um, two municipal councillors on this. There was um, some farmers on it, and then the district agriculturist. <laughs> so you have this pilot running, and it um, ended up being quite successful. You can press. Yeah. So, so basically, next. Oh, yeah. When you're saying 33% of the uh, province is farmed, is that open land to farming, to ranching, everything like that? That is my understanding, you know, from the census data. That's how they we got those numbers from was from the um, federal stats Canada numbers on it. All right. Yeah. So it was um, a success. And um, next slide, please. We then got to um, a uh, act that uh, proposed the. Uh, formation of Ag Service Boards. And this is the resolution that was passed uh, that established those boards. And it assigned specific duties in, to the municipalities and uh, it came into being in 1945. Next slide, please. So uh, behind this was um, Bill Lobe. He was the provincial supervisor at the time. He helped to um, established the act and also organized and developed the program, which included the Norway RAP program, which uh, when you see the world map and you see basically Antarctica and Alberta and I think one other island in the Atlantic that is, you know, uh, considered RAP free, and that's quite the legacy that came out of it. So it's interesting that at the beginning of the program, um, the um, grant that was provided to the um, municipalities that were participating was a thousand dollars. So we've put a little waste from there. You even hit the movie route too. You even hit the exactly like you don't get better than that when you yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, there, so like were there were there rats invested in the province at that time or were they doing pro active? Mostly just politicians. <laughs> And still are. They, they, the rat program only works again. Rats <laughs> bottom <off. laughs> so we're uh, we're dealing with the little four-legged ones. And uh, my understanding, and yeah, I I am not the rat specialist. That's Karen, uh, but that um, they were seeing a lot of issues with destructions of um, you know grains and bins and things like that in the surrounding areas. And what it was doing was they had to do that massive effort to secure and eliminate. And because of the dedicated efforts, they were able to clear the little bit that was encroaching. And then be then they were able to make it rat free. Yeah. Thank you. And that doesn't mean rats don't come in, but it means that we are able to detect them and eliminate them from continuing to breed. 
do they have a dollar value of say like on what uh, that program may have saved Alberta? Well, I don't. I, I believe that there has been some economic analysis, but I did do a uh, course, actually through Coursera, through uh, Illinois Urbana, and it was about looking at it at a global basis of what that is, you know, just looking at the destruction of crops in the bin, as well as what you lose in the field. And they were estimating it globally, um, what was that? or 30 billion dollars globally you know just when you think of all the different commodities all the different stages that rats can affect from just the seed into the planting all of the inputs that go in and then you get losses of crops so they were doing a very comprehensive analysis of the entire system i, um, I had read an article once about saskatchewan they figured that it was um, anywhere from 25 to 30 million dollars in cost to have rats around because they actually did a quite a study and to see what it would cost them to eradicate oh, rats you. out of there so. yeah it'd be interesting to see like the dollar spent versus the dollars that mm -hmm. yeah in exchange i think you know when when obviously they're doing that i can look i can get back to you on what that actually is um you know for here but you know, they kept the program going, and I cannot imagine them doing that if there wasn't a great ROI on it. I don't care to say like, what the costs on it, you know, keep those little backwards out of here. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it just, it pays for itself in the yield and the, the productivity we're able to retain for the investment put in. So every, you know, dollar we're you know, you put the effort into farming, the time, all the input costs, things like that, the storage costs, the transportation costs. You know, at least I, I look at it, it's basically insurance. You know, the squirrels that we have a hard time trying to control here, they're bad enough. Yeah, yeah. So it shows, yeah, if you get on it. And um, yeah, I think Bill Lope was pretty much a visionary in my estimation. When you look back, somebody at that time in the 40s, you know, being able to understand the impact, the potential consequences, and put something in place that exists into the next century. You know, can we send them all back a, a big thank you? <laughs> yeah, but it, it was interesting. Doug looked up his um, obituary, and that was one of the things that really, uh, and he only died a few years ago. So um, that is kind of the lasting legacy, I would say. Yeah. Great one. I okay. think so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So when we looked at what is an Ag Service Board, and there is not just one um, way you can be an Ag Service Board. Uh, it can be, you know, all uh, council members. It can be, you know, um, independent members. It can be a mix. Uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, you can function as an uh, Ag Service Board. But basically, um, one of the key things that you are is an advisory. You're, a, you're formed under the Municipal Government Act. That's what empowers uh, this, the, the Ag Service Board Act. And it's because under the Municipal Government Act, Ag has a very special and unique focus. So that's, you know, in Alberta, you don't see this replicated in other regions. And again, I think it's that acknowledgement at a time where, you know, this was very innovative and it really, really um, stands out when you look at how agriculture is managed across, you know, the country. We, the Ag Service Board structure uh, is quite unique. And I think that is likely the envy of many jurisdictions when they see, you know, the ability we have to manage agriculture at a local level. So you're formed under the authority of the MGA as a council committee, and you're delegated the responsibility to look after agriculture concerns for the municipality. And next slide. So we start looking at what are those roles and responsibilities. So you definitely have um, legislative duties that are under the ASB Act. And with that comes roles and responsibilities for members 
and for the role of having an agriculture field map. Next slide. So this is just lays out kind of the structure of uh, what empowers the Ag Service Board. So the Ag Service Board Act is the enabler that um, gives you the authority, the delegated authority for the Pest Act, the Soil Conservation Act, the Weed Control Act, as well as providing support for the Animal Health Act. So it's really a comprehensive structure. So when uh, you then um, will dive into kind of what is in that Ag Service Board Act. And next slide, please. So this is uh, the act that, um, as I said, it has that authority. It has the um, spells out what your legislative responsibilities are. It allows ASBs to um, enter into agreement with the minister. That is what allows the grant program to um, exist. And it delegates the authority for enforcement um, compliance under uh, the other acts that I um, mentioned. And it tells how boards are established. Um, the memberships of the boards, what um, attendance. So they have, you know, a clause in there if you miss three meetings without being, you know, excused, absence, uh, then you're no longer part of the board. They have, um, you know, when you look at the Municipal Government uh, Act, and, you know, they require municipalities to have a code of conduct. That is, ex you know, extended down into the committees under the council. So there's a lot of connections. There's a lot of um, support there for what you do. And then it also has a requirement that you have an egg fieldman, and uh, we'll go into more of their roles uh, a little bit there. So the Egg Pest Act, um, we'll just cover some highlights in there. So um, we have Gaia Saisahai, uh, that is functions as the pest regulatory uh, officer for the Egg Pest Act, as well as the Weed Control Act. Mm -hmm. And under the Pest Acts, we have the uh, categories of pests and nuisance. And that is an important designation because with pests, then mm -hmm. you can issue notices. And uh, if it's a nuisance species, then it isn't about a notice, it's just about um, how you want to manage that. And so it's, well, it'll have a list of animal, birds, insects, plants, or diseases that can cause um, harm to uh, livestock, um, crops, property uh, in Alberta. So you, with this act, it, you have the authority to enforce it within your jurisdiction, but you can jointly appoint inspectors with another municipality. So the uh, act does break down in detail of that. And it also specifies what the duties of the individual landowners are. And that becomes really important when you're issuing uh, the notices. Next. Kelly? Yeah. At the last uh, meeting that we had with, uh, there was a resolution to stop the hunting of wild boars. Yes. Right, and that was defeated on there. I'd right. like to see if like ask you like what how, what's your perspective of it? Okay, should have should have it been passed? Should uh, should there be any hunting of it? Just under try to understand like of the yeah. eliminate them. Well, I am not a wild boar expert, but just listening to Carrie, our um, expert, and the initial kind of results, what they find is that when wild boar are hunted they then go into a more defensive evasive mode, which means that the methods of control and eradication for the entire sounder uh, become increasingly difficult. So, um, you know, they're obviously they're a very smart, smart species. And um, yeah, when they have, you know, been hunted, they will go, you know, under deep cover, under night, all of that kind of thing, which makes it more difficult for that complete eradication. And when you think they have the same gestation period as you know our domestic pig species, that well, I'll never forget, three months, three weeks, three days, that's a, an awful lot of piglets that can happen within a year. So you can start to see where the damage 
can be increasingly done. So I think my understanding of listening to the discussion that there was concerns of putting more, you know, control over what people are doing on their land. And um, I don't think, I think you would always be able to um, hunt or shoot any type of predator, you know, on, you know, you know, pest on your land. So I think it's going to likely evolve as more data comes in and, you know, we start to understand what we're trying to do is that kind of objective. So my understanding of it, what I, what it, I got from the feel of that conversation was the program they were using was not that successful, unfortunately. And when the, the, they asked how many that they'd actually trap, it was a very minute amount. So I think there was a lot of people there that said, well, if you're on, and I, it seems to me in five years, did they trap like 15 or something? They didn't have it. It was 20. It wasn't very yeah. many. It wasn't very many. Yeah. And they so were, that, you learn the methods better for it. When yeah. that hit the floor, it pretty much, you could just see the floor change. And they said, yeah. well, let them hunt because we, I mean, one hunting party could take out four or five, right? So I, that's what I felt from it. So, like the part that I saw in there, okay, if we keep on hunting them, yes, we could push them further into the bush and then they're going to be very difficult. But every contribution that you can, every pig that you take out is going to be a bonus. Yeah, and you I think that's where recreational hunting versus other hunting. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you, the, that particular resolution could have been maybe worked on a little bit heavier to come up with a better. And it was uh, emerging too. It was one that, yeah. you know, kind of came up at the last minute. There wasn't the time for, I think, um, you know, Ms. Municipalities Ag Service Board's Fieldman to really have a fulsome discussion mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and kind of work out all of these things, you know, very valid points that have to be considered in it. Um, yeah, it's just an understanding of their behavior, that hunting will likely make it harder to do that mass sounder uh, trapping. And yeah, it remains to be seen, you know, what is going to be that best approach, but it, it definitely is a threat. And I you know it was funny, I was watching, um, news reports like you hear Ontario, Manitoba, like you're, you're seeing now a real awakening of this is a real threat, you know, to our land, to our property, you know, uh, with the damage that they can do, just even a few of them. I think the biggest thing I would say, like, if they ever get into um, more urban residents, say, like, if it's going to be in their camping grounds, yeah. then they'll then it's going to be a real big problem. But like right now, they just say, well, we don't really see it. Yeah. And it's the same as gophers out here. We recognize there's, there's quite a problem, yeah. but there's nothing down in Ottawa, but they walk too late. But... <laughs> there's a lot of things where um, more effective communication would go a long way of having mm -hmm. a really good and full discussion um, about the, you know, the information, being able to weigh in and bring it together to look at what is that best management uh, strategy that, um, you know, to reach your goals. So I hope that, you know, over the next few years, we do get that as, um, you know, the policies can always shift and, um, you know, Ag Service Boards as the advisors to the minister and through the provincial committee is going to be one of the most important ways of shaping that future policy in my view. Um, you know, counties that are dealing with it um, or have had issues, you know, you know, their experience is, is, you know, quite important. But as they move through, you know, into different ones, yeah, it's going to be, because it's, it's interesting. We just started asking on the annual report that you put in for the grant and I'll get to that in that section, but have you had any wild boar reported? Like we're trying to get that data out, you know, it, you know, how widespread is it? And it's interesting, you know, to see the number that have had reported sightings, you know, in the different, you know, areas outside of the ones that have been really dealing with it. 
are there many wild boar farms? Like there's one here in the county, and the policy is if we see seed out there, just eradicated. Yeah. So are there many pork farms are still in Alberta? There's still farms in Alberta, um, and there are municipalities that have put bylaws in that are prohibiting the establishment of any more. Um, there, I know um, the ones that have, they are very clear on, you know, the containment aspect of it because those, they can get through a heck of a lot. And when you, I, I saw for the first time um, last summer, you know, the fencing around a wild boar farm and it was quite eye opening, you know, to think. You know, it's like I've seen less for bison <laughs> of all of the layers that they have to have because of their behavior um, and desire. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question. At which point does it not become a wild boar? Because I know some how pretty they are. <laughs> how, how some breeding programs are bringing in. Other uh, genetics. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so they're yeah. they're gonna yeah. cross breeding and and having fifty percent if they escape. Exactly. Like I'm just not sure where the line is right now. And I think that is I don't believe there is a line that anybody has articulated. And I think that's part of the conversations that all of you that are involved in this you know, need to really take up. And there's the industry organizations, you know, you need that communication. You need all of the groups at the table to really get a handle on this. And there's also, you know, you, you know, they, they have all of the um, pressures now from, you know, incoming ones like, you know, we want to keep out African swine, you know, swine gluten. Like I'm getting up on my social media Beads from CFIA, you know, don't bring in pork, you know, <laughs> from this, and I'm okay, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, it's hitting social media for a number of reasons, but that's the disease side. But when you look at this desire to breed, well, it was a diversification that brought them in in the first place. <laughs> so, you know, what what are the consequences? So I think when you really look at what you can do as a board and think what does it mean to agriculture and what are the threats what are the benefits you know you that's where your discussions can lie and some of them you know at the time can seem very esoteric but it, you know when you start to look at implications down the road it's good discussions are any of them ever raised within buildings not that I have seen. Okay, like why not? Yeah. There are some. I've just personally yeah. the ones that I've seen have all been outside, but we have doesn't... two farms two here. One we should do, but they we shut down after some negotiating, and then the other one's still running. So I know. Painters County has two indoor. Two indoor. Ones. And there's rumors of a third one, kind of north of Halkirk area. Not sure Stetler Line or. Paint earth line, but I heard about that within the last month or so that we're trying to figure out where they are. Yeah. I haven't got a name yet, but I'm just trying to yeah, I don't so know, or just want to know where my issues might be, right? Yeah, and I think the same, like, okay, they're inside, they're contained, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but if they do get out, then you've got similar issues but yeah i just personally have not seen you know any of the indoor ones but i'll tell you when you're looking across the fence at those ones outside i wouldn't want to be the, you know, on the inside that would be yeah yeah, you <laughs> yeah they're uh they're pretty aggressive i would mm -hmm. think you have to have some farmer protection in place well and not only farmers, but if you're going to allow a wild boar breeding program, you definitely want a healthy buffer from domesticated because yeah. you know they're going over, over uh -huh. and you've just compounded your problem. Well, just being in any pens with, you know, 
you get an irate sow. I'm sorry, they're just a regular pig. <laughs> just a regular pig. I've jumped the fence, <laughs> even my younger years. <laughs> they're not too, you know, welcoming of attention. They're not very social. That part, yeah. Unless they've been raised, yeah. you know, there, but, you know, just, I wouldn't be going in. <laughs> But yeah, all great questions and discussion. <laughs> well, weeds. That's um, oh, okay. We go back one. Yeah, yeah. So on the weeds, um, Gaia again is the uh, regulatory officer for that. And in the weeds, we do have the co uh, categories of the prohibited noxious and the noxious. And so we have lists of species under that, and that is going under um you know review of looking at you know what should be on what should be off and the same thing on the past i should have mentioned things like that so when did they figure that review will be done i think we're looking at probably about two three more months so do we have direct input on that or how does that the work? fieldmen are involved as a group just a few like not everybody not everybody we yeah. have a representative that sits at the table on the regulatory board with I think it's a committee of about 20. Yeah, so, so there's some, um, there's some grain producers, there's government, there's scientists, there's um, Alberta Invasive Council has someone sit on there. <clears throat> so, but we have, the fieldmen have one person that we have uh, appointed, I guess is the word. Bring that back. So I'm sure at some point we're going to get um, more of a what we heard and, you know, some type of rationale. The other thing that um, has been done uh, is that updating of looking at the um, risk um, assessments for the different species of concern. So uh, I think we have one more year of getting that done. And so all of that information would then come together. Um, I just see that we'll have six months to update our, our weed app, our bylaws. Yes. Yes. On um, those things, once, once everything goes through uh, on the things. Also, you also have the provision of um, Moving up the importance if there is a weed or pest in your jurisdiction that you want to raise, either onto noxious or on prohibited noxious, you have the bylaw process to be able to do that. Like we did with the absent uh, work. Yeah. So, yeah, all of those kind of make a difference there. So, uh, Soil Conservation Act. Uh, this is where um, Trevor Wallace, uh, who's uh, a nutrient management specialist, specialist, that is the person that is the um, officer uh, for Soil Conservation Act. And it's been around a while, and it's all about those uh, conservation practices um, to preserve productivity of the soil and the land. And uh, you have the act and you also have the ability to serve notice if there are uh, issues of concern that happen. And that enables you, same with the pests and the weeds, to take action uh, or impose conditions uh, if and take enforcement uh, steps if uh, necessary. And so, um, you know, they've, they've done a few things to update it over the years, but it is one that's kind of in your back pocket, and it really depends on what's going on in your particular area, uh, how much that you rely on it for soil and water uh, types of uh, events. But yeah, when there's been flooding, uh, I know some that have a lot of water systems going through it, they're looking at erosion and control on a regular basis. So it's uh, quite variable. Kelly, if I just may interject here. Yeah. After our ASB conference, the, uh, the board chairs of all the uh, ASBs met for 
just a roundtable discussion, basically. And one of the things that came out of that was the, I think, um, water erosion and damage from water was more in, I guess, I think largely it was the northern municipalities, but they're, because they're wetter than we are, but they, there was so much drainage going on where farmers would drain all the sloughs from one to another, to another, to another, and then on to the county ditches. And they were, it was taking out roads and bridges and it was, uh, it was draining so fast. Before there was always catching these little pools to catch and it took some days before they all ran over and it, it and the runoff was spread over many more days. This way, when it's all drained, it was, it was just running within a one day, the, all was it gone. Right over the roads and yeah. It can so that was, it's a new erosion problem in a way. I mean, yeah. since continuous cropping come in, you don't see soil erosion near so bad. No. But now you got your water erosion, sure man-made problems. Man-made problems that have created a solution for a particular landowner, but it just, you know, passes the problem down the hill. So yes, so fortunately things like this um, uh, act can help in those situations. And I think that if you have those kind of challenges and you look at it and if the tool isn't fitting the situation, that's when, you know, um, through the ASB uh, role for advisory to the minister, those kind of things need to go because that's kind of the impetus. It's really hard for us to get the um, momentum to open up an act to make changes. So it's important to hear from the ground where you need different tools or where a tool needs to be modernized. Yeah. I think the point that a lot of people are forgetting that they, to replenish the aquifer, we don't know exactly how it's really known, mm -hmm. but it, it is leaching down, from, say, like from surface. And the faster you move that water off, the less that we are going to be replenishing it. Yes. So I see a big problem coming in time that water. You're, we're, we're, we're depleting our aquifers. Yeah. And yes, we rely like on the rivers, like we're putting on water lines around the county here. But what happens if we don't have enough there either? Well, yeah, and they're talking about, you know, the, the, the large river system, but you're looking at all our, you know, main watershed areas and how much um, several of them depend on flows, the melt from the glaciers. Yeah, that can cause flooding, but it also lifts up and supplements you know that groundwater uh issues so when you have multiple things happening in concert yeah that becomes an essential you know decision point how do we let that replenish what are those pra practices strategies and they're long term they're not something that's you 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 don't see the immediate consequence but you also have to think about it in terms you know, of greater than just you know, one particular, you know, piece of land. Like I've seen the Mississippi River, and it is surprising how damn dirty that thing is. So you look at the amount of silt that goes down, yeah. and then out into the out into the uh, Gulf. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all of those things, and yeah, I think most of us have been around and seen, you know, times in a year what comes down, you know from the mountains, from the different runoff areas. And, yeah. Consequences later on, though. It is. It's a hard one. The Animal Health Act, um, we have our chief provincial vet, Dr. Keith Lehman, that um, uh, spoke at the conference and uh, also has been on our webinars. Um, this is the person who has the authority for all the animal diseases and outbreak control. Uh, when you look at the Animal Health Act, it is a very extensive act in the act and regulations. They are updating some parts of it. Uh, but uh, basically in your role, it is about, about support for that. So if there is an outbreak, but the part that's becoming more and more um, of interest and essential is in the types of emergency response. So whether it be, um, you know, an accident on a highway or a natural, you know, a fire, a flood, you know, those types of things, there's always the issue of how do you, um, you know, look after the livestock? How do you move them out of harm's way? How do you 
uh, support producers in there. So there's a lot of momentum towards having um, the Ag Service Boards think about what the role of agriculture is in those incidents, including provisions. So some have their own, you know, livestock emergency plan and some just have uh, a little addendum to um, what go flows into the larger municipal plan. See that sheep never get sick, so they're not on the page here. You see that, right? No. Never. You know, no, we haven't had. No, they don't, because they either die. <laughs> they don't get sick, they just die. So. There you go. But maybe we should cook. Yeah, that's a good thing. We should have sheep on there, too. <laughs> Chickens. Yeah. yeah. A lot of issues there. there. We don't have any problems with chickens in our county. There's no chickens. <laughs> yeah. We want to gently move on before we get on the chicken. <laughs> as long as you don't start doing the bird dance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then we're all good. So, yeah. So, you are the authorized persons in that. So, again, thinking uh, in terms of if there was uh, an animal disease outbreak with a mass depopulation event, is livestock. Uh, you know, in your, um, under your control jurisdiction, you know, do you have a place for a mass disposal site? Do you, are you able to transport? What are you able to do uh, to help and support? Because those kinds of things, when they come up, it's important to have that thought through. So that's kind of what Keith has been talking about and Brad Andres as well. Um, they look at those things. Keep going. So, like on that point, say like if there was a mass eradication of say like some animals. Yeah. Where are there certain places that you can only they they get pit? There there are um, very um, clear conditions. So there's certain, of course, it depends on what I understanding the number of animals that weight of animal that has to be disposed, and there's conditions of what has to be you know, lined so it's not leached. So the type of soil that it's going into, you know, what it, that could potentially do to water bases as they break down. So there's a lot of things about containment. So um, that's where they say, you know, within each of the county's municipalities, some may not have any areas where that would be suitable. So, you know, what happens? But if you do have an area, at least having them identified, then you would work with uh, Keith's staff and, you know, Brad to make sure that it gets done properly. You have to be a certain amount away from a well, water table. Yeah. Do we have well. any sites that, like, if we had a VSEL break or something like that, what? It could be a loss of what's on the map, but we have some sites kind of like between Warden and Big Valley, we've got some area. We would just have to go, hey, can I dig a hole put contaminated animals on your land? We also have, we also have the <clears throat> quarter up by the uh, landfill, which is a class two site, and it has been already okay. identified as a clay based for that. That's why we picked it there. Okay. The, and the fact that our, our landfill is able to be a class two, they can bury there. So if they had to, they could open it. We've had that discussion on emergency okay. management. It's been denied before though to yeah. go there. Well, I think that was before we had that discussion because they did change it to a class two. You can, they were taking sheep heads and stuff now. So they've changed that. So, uh, the issue at Was it live? It was a Lacombe, I think, had some livestock issues and they were looking for a place to put the animals. And they asked about the landfill. It wasn't allowed. They were asked about the straw. It wasn't allowed. Even though it was designed and designated for that purpose, it was denied. You know, we really have to watch up there with pigs. The swine, because I don't think backers would be too thrilled with us falling in a bunch of. And, <laughs> yeah, backers aren't that far apart. Well, 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 they're what big barns. Like, yeah. 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 So that's the kind of discussion and kind of thinking, you know, as a board when you're looking at your planning and you know, plans is, you know, consider that when you're saying, saying how do we support? That's one of the things um, that you can kind of have planned out because you don't want it to happen. You don't want any emergency, but it happens. 
that's something I can bring back. I can show you the map mm -hmm. in one of our next meetings. So does the NRCB get involved into something like this? I know with environment, a lot of that does come into play with their um, rule. Um, I'm not, does, you know, uh, when it, when it becomes a livestock emergency, I don't think they're involved. They're involved, they're involved in some of the pre-planning, but when it comes to, if, if Dr. Lehman said, you got to bury this many head, they just said, make sure you got all your ducks in a row. They don't, uh, yeah. they don't say no. So that's where it's the relationship and, you know, kind of having things thought out ahead of time becomes really important because at that point, yeah, it can be a real scramble. And um, I think that's why they're uh, really strongly encouraging um, every, you know, county municipality to kind of look at what's going on in your area and what is the kind of likelihood of the scale and what you would need to be able to do in those response scenarios. Last, uh, last year, there was a, a lagoon that was built in the county here. And I had a question on where it was built and it was okayed by the NRCB of where it was on a sand scene and they put a clay liner into it. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen on another lagoon around here that the neighbors know exactly when they're dumping them because when they stir them, it gets into the aquifer. Okay. So like with the NRCB, the way they had come back in, I would never trust them and saying, okay, make a pit, say we're going to bury animals yeah. out. Yeah, I don't, I've never heard Keith or Brad talk about you know, the connection in uh, the state of emergency with NRCB. Um, Kelly, we just had a board member join us late. Yes. That's Paul McCabe. Yeah. Hi, Paul. And uh, Kelly Jackson is our okay. presenter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so moving into some of the other um, um, duties that you have. So uh, I've been referring a lot to your role as advisory to council and to the minister. So um, if any act, a piece of legislation that you would ever choose to read, the Ag Service Board Act is actually a, an approachable piece of legislation. Um, I do have all my legislation in a binder that I can refer to uh, at a time. And I will say the most challenging and thick one to go through is animal health. And the easiest mm -hmm. one to go through, um, in my opinion, is the Ag Service Board Act, the one that empowers what you do and supports all of the work. So um, I would say take a look. It's um, you know quite easily understood, and it doesn't have a lot of you know obscure terms and jargon in it. So uh, the advisor to the council of ministers. So that means that you're here for anything agriculture. So decisions that council has to make, you're the ones that kind of provide that input, and uh, also through the provincial committee. Uh, that's that advisory role to the minister. And um, I think we've seen the minister um, we have now is, I would say it's encouraging the level of interaction that he has taken so far. Uh, he came to the provincial conference uh, he stayed for a number of hours and he's asking when they can meet next time. So, you know, that's... Who's the new minister? <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I wonder who's in yeah. I wonder. <laughs> Importantly, where is he from? Yeah. 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 So you may have some, yeah, uh, you know, it's more it's ins than yeah. many, you know, uh, getting the ear. But I do echo what Kelly just said. The uh, the provincial ag committee was very impressed that he met with them and requested future meetings with them. So yeah, they were very happy. Yeah. So you know, uh, it's it's good to have that relationship recognized and um, to understand the value that it brings. You know, to should mention who we're talking about. It is Nate Horner. It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Through there. So 
there you go. Uh, the other part is uh, that you advise on and you provide direction for is the weed and pest control in the soil and water conservation programs. So this is where, you know, you kind of decide what are the issues and where do you put the resources. So it's the things that you can do are never ending and uh, it's all about that prioritization what is important in this area now and for the future that you are uh, taking actions in your programming to deal with. Uh, we've been through a lot of the uh, control in the animal diseases uh, and one that gets a lot of attention because it's so broad and this is about the sustainable um, agriculture and looking at the economic viability producers. So this is where you can literally fit most anything ag related into what you're considering um, that you need in this county uh, to make sure agriculture is sustainable and that uh, producers are able to continue uh, with their livelihoods. So yeah, you, you keep hearing, well, you know, what should we be looking at? Well, you know, that's where you have that latitude to really figure that one out. And the last one uh, is about policy development. So it's that you have input into the policies. It's not necessarily, you may write them, but generally, um, you know, I haven't met many boards that want to sit down and actually write, but they um, do have direct input into uh, setting what those policies would be. And one of the things that I think uh, is, is really important in that is that every, you know, jurisdiction has others that are around and farmers farm between, you know, different counties. And so you may have a policy that differs from a neighboring county, but as long as it's a well-written policy and there's a strong rationale behind why you have that policy, then it's a lot easier to communicate to landowners why you have it in this area. And it's not that you have to align everything, but it's about making sure you do have policies just that are support the programs, that support the legislation, and all of those things in, you know, <laughs> line up for what you have here. So that's um, an important part of it. The other uh, things that you do is um, under the legislation is you have to have the field committees. And each uh, legislation has a little bit different uh, requirements for what that appeal committee needs to be. And it's not to say you can't have one doing them all, but it's important to note that you have to have the motions um, you know, in council for the appeal committee that has, uh, for APA, the Pest Act, they have to be appointed for the start of a calendar year. And then weed control is about their independence. So it can't be the people who are involved in okaying a notice because that is a, a conflict of interest under, you know, the, you know somebody who said yes to go forward. Uh, It'd be yes. pretty hard to have. This one has the wrong guidance. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that part. Um, the one that differs is that the board can act as the appeal committee for soil conservation. So that is one where uh, some there's some latitude in that. So uh, what I've seen a lot do is that they will, in their operational meeting in the fall, they will appoint the an independent appeal committee starting at, uh, you know, for January to December of the year. And that means they can have one committee that does it all. I've also seen some in um, neighboring um, counties, they'll have MOUs that, you know, they hear each other's appeals and that way, you know, it's the Ag Service Board, um, it's, you're knowledgeable, you understand what's involved and you, but you have that independence because it's not your, um, you know, landowners that are, you're responsible for. So there's a lot of ways of getting around that. 
The other thing that you can do as a board is that you can appoint um, committees to advise you. So if there is a special um, project of interest that you need advice on, you can strike a committee to look at that and report back to you. And you can have more than one. So if it was something, you know, under this sustainable, you know, agriculture kind of thing that you want to compare things to, you can have two committees looking at it and then provide the reports back to you. So it, it's not that they are established, you know, um, uh, it doesn't have to be ongoing. It can just be for a discrete amount of time. So um, that's an, a part that um, the Act enables you to do as well. The part of the responsibilities of the municipality, they, it's those motions in council for the appointment of the fieldmen and the inspectors for approving any of your bylaws and the policies that you are recommending. So sometimes when uh, all council members are part of the ASB, it gets a little confusing because you make your recommendation as the ASB, but, uh, but the motion has to be approved in the council meeting minutes. So sometimes that gets uh, messed up at times. So uh, it's just important to understand which hat you're wearing and to have the motion recorded uh, appropriately. And as we've gone through um, about the control of pests and weeds on your land and providing that extension, that information to landowners on what their responsibilities are. So you recall in the acts, it does um, uh, outline what those um, requirements are. We're actually appointed here by council. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that is what council is responsible for doing, but you are responsible for recommending. And then you have a lot of other things that you get involved in, in the policy side and the programming side. So this is really where you want to, um, to me, it's about what is on the center of your plate versus side. So your programming, that needs to deal with the issues that are the most important to you. And that's where you got to hit those notes. And there's so many ways you can do it. It's not that it has to be one on one. It doesn't have to be a webinar. It can be, you know, a series, um, you know, a Facebook post that constitutes part of your programming of getting information out, as you were talking about with the purchase of strychnine, you know, that you come into the end of sales. The other part that um, is sometimes overlooked is about strategic planning. And yes, you can, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can think about what you want for agriculture as a whole in the county and have a plan for a uh, strategic plan for moving it, or you can provide advice into the municipal plan. So both ways are equally valid. It just really depends on what is the best way to do it in your uh, particular area. So that's something that, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more than just uh, providing, you know, uh, what you intend to do in the grant application. It's really about thinking how you're going to move the issues of the day for agriculture through. So, um, it's nice to have those plans. It's because it's a roadmap and it also supports your budgets. The other duties um, is that there needs to be uh, at least annually a report from the Ag Service Board to council. So yes, you have your minutes for your ASBs, but it also has to be uh, at least one a year uh, report given to council. And again, we have to have, make sure that an egg fieldman is appointed. So one of the things that we see when we're out in the field visit sometimes is that we ask, can we see the motion in council for the appointment of the egg fieldman? Well, the egg fieldman's been around 20 years or more, and it's like, what the heck? So one of the practices that you know a lot have started to do is that 
you know, maybe every decade you kind of refresh that and just make sure it's up to date in the council minutes and that you can actually find it because when things were all done on paper versus, you know, digital, digital now it's a lot easier to retrieve it. But that's one of the things that um, you just have to make sure that it's been done. <laughs> if you're not having a bad weekend, right, Jared? <laughs> I don't think he's going to find any humor right now. He's still in the midst of it. <laughs> so we get down to the members of the Ag Service Board. So, you know, to be a ASB member, it's just it's just not anyone on the street or, uh, you know, uh, it has to be people that are knowledgeable on agriculture, the issues, the concerns, and that can provide that kind of input. You have to be able to give input to develop the right policies um, and that you have to understand how these policies have to align and support the legislation. And um, yeah, so it has to be someone who's willing to be engaged, who understands what needs to get done and then participates to um, make sure council de determines what you know whether it's going to be the whole council of the board if it's going to be certain members that'll be on it or that it's all going to be um you know outside so there's so many different ways to have a board and uh it but all boards have to meet those um requirements of the act and when you start to think about, you know, the interactions, there's a lot of um, participation, a lot of governance, and it comes back to being able to step out of your own interests and into the interests of uh, agriculture as a whole for the county. And I think that's probably um, one of the things that's most challenging for everybody is like, yeah, I know what I need, but what does, you know, the others in my region need? And that's where representation, you know, is, is really important to be able to do that. And then in that role is then you can make those recommendations to council, whether it's through the, you know, strategic plan or if it's on an issue by issue basis uh, that you're doing that. So there's um, an orientation manual that we have um, that kind of covers in a little bit more detail the things that we are talking about today. And we also update annually a fact sheet that talks about um, what Ag Service Boards have achieved. So we update that annually. We use the information from the reports to um, produce that. We're also working on um, a number of other, uh, uh, you know, I'll call them infographics, so visual with uh, representation with a few little facts thrown in. And I would say one thing is interest, where we keep talking about notices issued and enforcement and compliance. But what we have found is it's your programming that your egg fieldman does, all of the conversations, all that extension. So when you look at the WEED uh, Act compliance, 97% is achieved through that education and awareness versus, you know, the issuing of a notice and a very similar number when you look at PEST. So that's where, to me, it really demonstrates that value of the programming and of the work of the fieldmen when you, when you think about that compliance side. So, who is your fieldman? It's full time, qualified, and uh, is able to um, fulfill the legislated responsibilities for the policies and programs that you have. And also, they uh, are the manager of all the resources, ag resources in the municipality. They, through their uh, appointment, they are uh, inherently a designated officer for the acts and um, also as an inspector. So the again, these are the acts that they are designated for and uh, under the Animal Health Act, they become an authorized person and they implement the policies to ensure that all the, uh, there is compliance with the legislation. 
So there's a lot that they do in uh, carrying that out. There is a ton, a ton of paperwork, and I should really, Quentin can probably address this slide way more. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of details that are involved uh, to make sure that when you do go to any of the regulatory side, all of the punctuation is correct in that you have complied with every requirement for issuing a specific type of notice. And that is really important when you look at, um, you know, you can lose, if something goes to appeal, you can lose an appeal because you haven't followed the independence of a weed, you know, uh, 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 appeal committee. So there are all these things that come together that they are aware of. And as I, um, just share the communication role is so critical. Yeah. When, how come you never wear your sheriff's badge? <laughs> Can't afford it. <laughs> it's inside. <laughs> One question too, is that your office in the slide? Some days. <laughs> okay. Um, is, we hope Ben just drives around in a truck all day and sells rotten poison. He doesn't do anything else. <laughs> That's it, but yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think you escape the office, but yeah, you need there to. There are days where you just can't your truck and go because you need to. Yeah, exactly. All these things, but yeah. Um, That's when you're liaison. You're really yeah. definitely. And I think it's um, when we've started to share the, um, you know, the high percentage of issues resolved through that you know, communication and liaison, the education awareness role, it really, really shows how important it is for them to have that truck and get up and do that. And, you know, even through all, the, you know, the pandemic, you know, not being able to have the usual kinds of events and things like that, they're still getting that information out, which is amazing. So there is a part of the Ag Service Board that allows um, you to take over land uh, in specific conditions. So this is a land under supervision and also the order of reclamation. And I don't know, have you had to do that? No, and I recommend you don't let me do that because that's a pile of work. And all I'm going to say about it is if you ever do, then just yeah, get in touch with Doug because uh, yeah, it's kind of his role to help the board through. Yeah, there's a lot of very narrow channels you have to navigate through uh, to that pro process, but it can be well, it can be contentious as in that you know people don't like their land being taken over. But there are some times when it has been a, a very necessary and uh, successful step in dealing with chronic um weed issues so you know it's there if you need it and i am not an expert so the problem i have with it is that if it gets that bad and the county takes it over we clean it up by farming it and then whatever there's left for profits after i've taken care of expenses the landowner gets those profits so basically i'm farming the land for him and he's making money which isn't which isn't fair, right? There's a lot of money in farming. I don't know what you've been told in school, but there is no money in farming. Because <laughs> you have to pick fair market yeah. um, contractors, right? To to farm the land. You can't just pick the most expensive guys to eat up the expenses or eat up the profits. You have to be fair about it. So typically you can make a little bit of money at it that there's profits left over when you're done paying your expenses. And, that just doesn't sit well with me. There, there's a lot of, yeah. So, but it is there if you have, you know, something that is chronic. I think that's, it definitely isn't a first, you know, choice tool to use. And there's a whole bunch of other legislation you may come in contact with. Um, well, Clinton will come in contact with in the role of fieldman and, you know, 
from stray animals to, you know, AOPA. Um, there's a lot of different things that you may have to, uh, you know, kind of deal with um, in the course of making sure that all of the other requirements are met because they'll intertwine uh, with it. But um, yeah, it's just it's just to know when you have to address these other acts and legislation. Okay, provincial committee. So when you think of having, you know, 69 egg service boards and, you know, and each one uh, being advisor to the minister, to their respective councils, you can see that there is a, you know, a benefit from having a provincial committee that where the concerns of the individual egg service boards within a region can go into the region and then can go up to the province. Um, and there's a way to discuss and kind of get a consensus on what are the issues and what are the key things that need to go through to the minister. You kind of, you know, they deal with so many things that when something that you bring forward to them in advisory, you know, you want it to make sure that it is something that is not just uh, a me issue, it's a we issue that goes forward. So the provincial committee, um, they are the ones that are providing advice and recommendations. Um, they have that role. Uh, there's a lot of communication between um, the provincial committee and, um, you know, Doug is the ASB program manager. It's um, being the one that can be that voice for ASBs with the minister. They go to a lot of different meetings um, with different departments. They're always ones that are raising the profile. Um, they do that through uh, a lot of cooperative work at the municipal levels and the different committee levels. And it's making sure that, you know, if you've got a particular issue and, you know, it's kind of a new policy you're developing, well, there's likely some other, you know, uh, board that has dealt with this before, provincial committee can get you to the right people. So you're, you know, not trying to reinvent a wheel that's already been, you know, going. you just tweak it for what you need. And they're also that part of the review and approval of the resolutions that go forward from the region uh, to the provincial uh, conference. So it's a pretty um, significant um, level of responsibility through the provincial committee, but it is a great uh, group to have and they've been quite effective. So each region has their representative and their alternative uh, for the five regions and there's um, others that are on it that represent AAAF, um, that um, have, you know, Linda as the executive assistant to the Mitchell committee is on it, plus there's reps from R RMA, uh, AAAF, Doug is also on it as the ESB program manager, and Arlene is there as the recording secretary. And when you look at the level of engagement they had in 2021, uh, there was a lot of meetings, um, you know, with minister, with delegations, with uh, different ministries, um, DMs, ADMs of the, the, you know, the Rural Caucus and South. Um, they're part of the uh, ADM ASB chair town hall. They had input on the regional liaison program and all the different types of committees on climate, weeds on well sites, and with CFIA on that modernization of the seed uh, regulatory. So they've been a, a voice, and I would expect that this group is going to be no different uh, than the others. They're very uh, well engaged, and, you know, it was really great when you said, yeah, they were quite happy with, you know, how things start, are starting to look. So one of the ways of keeping up with what they do is just to sign up for their blog. Um, this is the page where you can do it. And they, um, you know, after any kind of 
uh, engagement or work that they've done, it gets updated here. So it's a really great way for all Ag Service Board members to um, you know, keep up with what is going on with the provincial committee is you know, just to get these regular notifications uh, about it. Um, there's also other committees that um, with when Fusarium Gram and Miram uh, got um, taken off the pest list, the uh, action committee became an industry led, but um, they're still involved in it. And there's also other ones like the club group action committee that um, they participate on. Here we start to look at the program. So a lot of the acts refer to the minister's representative. And in the case of the Ag Service Board, that is Doug. So I think all of you know Doug pretty much. Um, he used to be out of Leduc, but will be out of Stony Plain as there we'll, we will no longer have a presence in Leduc at that office as of, I think, sometime in March they're being dispersed. So the staff in that office are going to different office locations once we go back. And then um, I think many of you would have met Alan at Betha. He is the ASB specialist and he is out of Lethbridge. So he had a long history in the department before taking on this role um, you know, under irrigation and he knows a lot about soils and things like that. So mm -hmm. he's a, a fabulous re resource. He also is the one who runs the legislation course that is offered every year. It's uh, they're at the midpoint of it now. And I think there's 15 or 16 um, people that are taking that course right now. And here's some other contacts that we have within um, the department. So um, David Findell, uh, he is a director for the surveillance um, section and he is active now in the role of the Chief Provincial Plant Health Officer. Uh, we, my understanding is that I think they're now, or they have just, or are just about to post for that position. So hopefully we'll have somebody in back in that role uh, soon. Um, Dale Krapko is the manager for the environmental program. So if in your grant agreement, you have uh, resource management funds, Dale is the person that um, runs that particular um, uh, part of the program. Um, Shelly Barkley, she kind of heads up our entomology, the surveys there, and Doug is in the acting role as the provincial entomologist I don't know if that position is going to be filled or anything like that, but um, he, he has taken on the extra duties for that. Mike Harding is the plant pathologist and looks after the disease surveys. I've talked about Gaia as the pest regulatory officer for the weed and pest acts. And uh, Chris Neeser, Neeser, who is also in Brooks with Shelley and Mike, is the um, principal weed scientist, so still in that role. So that's kind of the some of the key ones that we have left in the <coughs> department. So when we look at the program, um, it has the administration of the grant. That's part of the principal uh, roles. We also have our role in the uh, legislation. We have the role as a liaison and also um, part of education and extension about the legislation and about the different components that are in it. So if there is a question on an interpretation of legislation, we try to look at that and how we can get information out. So within the grant, there's the ledge funding, ledge stream funding, the resource management funding, and the RAP program. There used to be um, the ear bounty grant, but that is no longer in effect. And so there'll be, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, that wild boar eradication program that's in there. So the grant, you can use it for a variety of um, supports. 
So a lot, um, you know, with labor, some operating for vehicles and equipment, things related to the supplies, materials you may need for your programs, operating um, particular offices, and also some contracted services. So in the past, when we used to look at the breakdown, you can see, and it's probably still very similar, majority do go towards covering salary costs and program costs and vehicle. And then the rest of it then um, is really depending on what uh, needs to happen in a particular area. So the grant application process is you have to have the municipality with an established egg service board with a fieldman appointed and you have to get your application in by the due date. So pretty straightforward eligibility requirements. Um, one of the things that uh, we were able to uh, achieve is changing it from a three to a five year so you don't have to apply as often now. Um, the activities that are eligible, as we said, things that are related to the legislation, um, all of those kind of things are um, covered. And, you know, different things that the minister uh, sometimes requests, or there can be things that you want to do in addition in your municipality, like maybe more surveys because of a pest of concern or, you know, a rabies vector control program. So these are some of the um, things that um, some will put in place with the dollars. So you get, um, you put in your application from that, it is reviewed. Uh, there's a process for the legislation and there's a process for resource management. And if you're one of the um, counties along the Saskatchewan border, there's also funds for the rat control that go there. So you get, you put in what you're uh, agreed to do and uh, basically that gets reported on each year. You get a signed agreement and away you go, the um, dollars get dispersed. So we have certain outcomes that your activities are going to track that support. So it's looking at all of the programming that goes towards um, the wheat pest and soil making sure that there are supporting policies that align with the legislation, that there is protection of soil and watershed health, and that uh, there is collaboration. So those are the outcomes that we have to report back on. So we do that in an annual report. Um, Quentin looks forward, I'm sure, every year <laughs> to getting a link sent out uh, and there's two months to re, um, to get that report in. And so uh, it's all online. There's a number of questions that are there. They're pretty stable year to year. We've just reviewed, there's kind of minor tweaks this year in uh, some clarity. There is the need to submit uh, your income and expenditures and there's a filing with municipal affairs. And then the grant payments are issued following review and approval of the submitted reports. So there's a review of your responses for legislated programming questions, and there's uh, um, another review for the resource management stream. The other thing that we have mm -hmm. in um, uh, that ties in with the grant is our field visits. So basically you can, uh, you'll get a field visit about once every five years. This is in addition to the reporting. Uh, so when the Auditor General looks at uh, how did we verify, so we have the grant reporting annually, and then we have the sort of the ground truthing that goes out uh, with the field visit. So we have done a number of things to um, sort of increase the value of that day that we come and spend is that we have really looked at focusing. Um, we have a checklist which gives you the opportunity to provide us a lot of documents in advance. And so that on the day of the visit, we can really spend most of the time going and seeing, you know, your programs in action. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity. We feel that you showcase the things that are working, the things that you're having challenges with, and it really 
um, helps to show the value of what you're doing in your programs. So it kicks off with, um, you know, visit of police and board members can be there and then any kind of documents that we weren't able to see in advance, we look at and then it's really about touring sites. In the report, we, fo we try to focus on answering questions that relate to, um, as I said, that kind of that ground truthing, that verification. And we issue recommendations and we categorize them now based on whether they are critical, critical or anything that could um, affect your eligibility for the grant. So we want to clear those up right away. And they're usually pretty straightforward because it's usually just getting a motion in council most of the time um, that clears those up or making sure that your appeal committee is, you know, uh, appointed, has the independence and is for the calendar year. So it's things that could disperse, you know, in that. Then we have things that are significant. So they could trip you up maybe through the appeal process or something like that. So you want to get on those because you want to make sure you're aligned with the legislation, but they don't necessarily affect your grant funding, things like that. And then there's a category of enhancement, which things that are nice to do, but you need to look at it and say, is this a priority? So we want to focus on those. So at the end of the visit, you know, we go through everything, you know, with the fieldmen and they basically know what the recommendations are, are and where the categories are. So if, you know, we, you know, oh no, that shouldn't be this way. You, you didn't hear we had this. So we have a chance to clear things up right there that day. Then we go back, we do a draft of the report, we send it to your fieldmen. They have a chance to look at it. And again, no, you know, we, we have this, not this, you know, and we clear that up. Then once it's all okay, then we send you um, the final report. So that goes and it gets signed off by the fieldman and the ASB chair so that you're basically saying, yes, we understand the recommendations and we're agreeing to address them. So that kind of closes the loop so that um, when the program, the grant program gets reviewed by Alberta's Auditor General. They can see that we um, addressed, you know, any issues and we have uh, prioritized them. So, and the feedback we've been getting is that new municipalities are finding it more of a value now that they can see exactly what they need to focus on and not kind of go through the report to, well, that was nice, that was nice, that was nice. Yeah, but what, what do we need to do? So we've kind of drawn that out, but we also um, include all of the, the good things. You know, that's the majority of the report still. Program reviews, uh, 2019, we had our last program review. And as I said, out of it, the five-year funding, you know, came into be, but it is also things that we look at and, um, you know, try to, internally improve the program delivery, the program, you know, plan capacity. And that's one of the kind of things I, I started working with the ASB program through this program review. And basically now uh, way more of my time is involved with ASB than anything else that I do, you know, used to do. So, you know, it's kind of that gateway. <laughs> I call it into it and uh, yeah, it's been really good. So yeah, so you'll, over time, you'll see us um, doing the program reviews because we always want to see what's working. What do we need to do more of, less of, or what do we need to start doing and stop doing? So that's really the questions that get answered in the program review. That then that brings us to the changes that we had for the regional liaison program. So the previous program review had uh, indicated that the egg service boards wanted to have more contact with the department. And out of that came the initial key contact program. And so that's where uh, egg service boards who wanted a, um, a contact had a person, a staff person assigned, and they were at your meetings, they you know, kind of 
Fieldman, it was somebody that you could turn to if you needed help navigating something through uh, the department. When we had the cuts, we no longer had the majority of those people. Uh, and we no longer had the capacity to have a person assigned. So the regional liaison program came out of that of having somebody who would be that key contact person, but for a region, not just one per um, county. So that means that the delivery of the program is a little different. We're, we obviously can't be at every meeting. Uh, some, but the contact is going majority of the time through the fieldmen, and some are doing that. It's all remote. Some will come in person to meetings. Some will join meetings, you know, remotely. Uh, so the program is evolving as to how we contact and how we interact. So that's kind of where we're at uh, in that particular one. So um, this is the current structure of our team. So we have at least one person for every reason, uh, region. Uh, Cass, uh, she is filling in for Krista Demiliano, who's off on that leave right now. Um, so she's working with the, the Northeast and as I said, um, the one that I've got, the Central region. Also, as part of um, the liaison, as we've um, started a, I think it's basically a quarterly type of um, newsletter, the ASB Connector. So this is where we um, put information out um, that we aggregate from, you know, sometimes it can be from the Ag Info Center, things that they've dealt with. It could be Agri News that Caitlin Reserve, she is dealing with, it can be issues that you've brought to us that we you know kind of report back on that are that is of interest to more than just one egg service board so that comes out quarterly um, that, that started back i think we've had two newsletters out now so okay, just are you boarding them because i don't think i've seen that nope. okay. i just well, I can forward you the connector itself. I just pull information out for the report, but I can just put that as a forward to you guys and then maybe add it in the uh, under the information item as as it comes up. Yeah. Would you rather that way? Yeah. So no problem on it. It is we consider it um it, uh, not as an external communication because it you're the our delegated authority partners so um it isn't something like agri news which goes up to the public it's something that we used to communicate um we still consider it an internal communication kind of thing for that purpose so um it's really so if you have ideas you have anything that you want us to include that is of interest um to more than one board that's where we're we usually contact our fieldmen and going hey any ideas for this anything that you want us to cover uh on on that kind of thing so yeah so yeah we just i think uh january the winter one came out and so then we'll be working on collecting information for the spring one the other thing is that there are um biannual town halls with the ASB chairs and the ADM. It, all board members are welcome to join, but it's basically, it's a chance for the board chairs to hear updates from John and uh, Conrad and to also ask questions. So again, if there are issues that you would like um, ADM Conrad to address, this is something where, you know, just let Quentin let us know, and we can get that prepped up to John. And even though we provide him with kind of guidance on, you know, here's key points, uh, anyone who has met with him knows that he can be quite unscripted. Yeah, and just basically speaks, you know, which I think personally is great. So, <laughs> yeah, so again, if there are things that you want, you know, to know more about, 
it's let us know and we'll make sure. So the next one will be coming up in the spring um, that John will have. And this is a little bit about the wild boar at large. So yes, it is an eradication project. It's joint with uh, Alberta Pork um, and Alberta Invasive Species Council and Alberta Environment and Parks. So it's kind of cool. They've had some of their um, the ones that can sniff out invasive species now are part of you know trying to locate where the centers are, things like that. So they have a new website and um, also there's a, a new email for reporting any uh, wild boar um, claims and things like that. Other thing it's not on the slide, but we do, um, we will be doing more um, webinars uh, with the fieldmen and a lot of times I think we've had, you know, board members join in. So we try to look at you know, what are the things that you want to have updates on from our partners, from our, you know, ourselves and our programs and things like that. So I think we're looking at um, the bilateral, the multilateral um, negotiations have started for the next policy framework for CAP, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership programs, suite of programs. So I think um, we're going to have an update on that type of thing um, if we're looking at one of the topics. So again, if there are any things that outside of the, you know, just having it in connector or having it as a topic with John, um, you know, we can bring in a number of uh, people to have those conversations. And so this kind of brings us to the end where, you know, this is what I was supposed to cover. Hopefully I did that. And kind of questions if there's things I'm not able to answer because I'm not a program specialist. Um, that's not my daily wick. I, I'm learning, I'm learning a lot. But uh, yeah, it's still Doug and Alan who are you know, kind of, they're the assigned people. I'm just kind of I've kind of tucked in for the ride, <laughs> just you see. Um, I really enjoyed working with the program and it's one of the things where, you know, we have so few opportunities to get out and actually talk to people who were, you know, there's, I can't think of very many things where we actually work with producers anymore. So at least we get to work with you guys, which is our connection now. So that's good. I used to do, uh, you know, business development, specialty crop, crops and horticulture and things. So yeah, I was all over the province uh, being able to do that. So it's nice to, you know, have that way to engage. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly, for coming out and thank you for coming in person. Oh, so much can be lost too soon. I mean, yeah. all of a sudden there's distractions and first thing you know, you're, you're really losing your audience and you don't know it. <laughs> but anyways. Oh, you feel it because you know, you're talking to yourself. Yeah. And at least I can look around these faces I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ours, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you did a good job. Not one person fell asleep today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just went. Yeah. <laughs> but um uh, kidding aside, no, thank you very much. It was very informative and, and you made what could be dry information actually very interesting. Oh thank you. So, yeah, no, it, it can be dry, you know, it just depends on the presenter. So obviously you're very good at your job. <laughs> Two things. Well, I do miss like when extension became a forbidden word in our, you know, in our world, uh, that was very hard because that was really a lot of what we focused on in the past was how do we package and we still have ways because in the legislation, it does still will say that the minister is responsible for the form and manner, which means that we do have an outreach component that we are required to do. So we still tag along in that, but our window went from here to here right, yeah. in the scope of work. And where's your office space? Out of Airdrie. Airdrie. Oh. Yeah. So hopefully you can join us again one day. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, in, in, my role, I do value very much, and because I've managed to 
I'll say infiltrate the ex service board program unit. <laughs> uh, I'm, I have more flexibility with being able to get out than some of the other liaisons who have a very, you know, different kind of line that they're in. So I feel very fortunate that I am able to do that. And the other uh, role that I took on this year is um, with the advisor to the Seed Processors Association for the Acted representative on that. So that fits in really nicely because we have um, the sea cleaning, the licensing inspection that is under the weed control legislation. So that really fits nicely. We are on the process of uh, updating the inspection licensing form. So being able to work with the fieldmen and being able to also um, work with the seed processors board and the actual managers is giving me you know that capacity but you know really only on. and i think we probably should have lunch here if you care to join us <laughs> with that well thank you very kindly and uh yeah your questions were great and it's so nice to have that interaction so thank you thank you so we'll have a recess till after mcc well that is my question i guess to this board we have a few items to to do yet do we want to take a short lunch and come back it's 20 or quarter to one, or do we want to continue it after MPC? That's I guess up to the board. Our MPC agenda, we could carry it after yeah. MPC. The only thing that Mr. Stolberg and I have another meeting at 4.30. So in our well, hopefully we're not in there. Soon. Well, we do have Alberta um, environment coming up to the MPC, sure. and we do have an in-camera presentation. So it is a little bit longer, but if you guys all cooperate, we can get to And if the chair brings us through it, that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What are you thinking, like an hour for MPC, hour and a half? Oh, I uh, know we're going to be a couple hours. So, so yeah, uh, yeah, I well, we've got two presentations that we don't normally It's have. probably easier to, because it's a separate broadcast, if I, if I break up ASB, it might not work on YouTube. Oh, okay. So, I need to do well. Yeah, if we come back, yeah. very half an hourty. If we take a half hour or just under and be back in here by 22, quarter to it, the latest, and we can get through this last bit. What's left shouldn't take us long, but looks of it. Long. I don't think so. Okay, someone will adjourn for lunch now. Mr. Nyberg adjourns us for lunch. Yeah. And Mr. Clark seconded, obviously.
Well, 50 actually. So we're. Did they phone back in again? No, I sent them a new link, but it's not. Are you on the phone? <clears throat> okay. Okay. So. For um, here. 7.2 and um, a G3 tour. I had uh, a board member approach me about. Uh, uh, putting in the, the possibility of touring the new G3 facility on our agenda to see if the AASB board are <clears throat> interested in doing that. And if they were, if G3 would be uh, receptive to touring their new facility. So um, I guess, first of all, is there an appetite to see this new facility in our county? Mr. Chairman, if I could, I was I'd asked you about this. The biggest thing that I noticed is, I mean, it, they're doing some gangbuster stuff there. Like they're there's a train all the time, um, and I just I know when it first uh, came to us, it was one of the biggest developments in a long time that we've had. And I would love to. Um, I think it would be important because I get a lot of questions about it. And, What's going on? So it'd be nice to get the the cold snows. I don't know. Has anybody hauled into there? And how did you like it? Good. No, very very satisfying going in there. Other than all you do is get on the scale, and that's as far as you go. You got to load your truck, or clean up the truck, and they'll come out since the pandemic's been on. Handy your your slip. So. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So. Yeah. so you don't get to see a whole bunch other than what you see through the window. You don't even get to go into the office to talk to me. What it gets me is like when I'm, when you travel to Redwood, when you see how many trucks are coming out from the west, going east. Yeah. I don't know like where they're coming from, but it is a good sign to see. Mm -hmm. My wife and I went to Red Deer the other day, and there was 13 trucks lined in going in, and there was a couple coming out as we drove by. Like we didn't stop. That there was like at least 15 trucks there. Generally, yeah. about seven o'clock, they've got half a dozen trucks are lined up in the morning. If, did, are you interested in looking at it? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd make the motion that we instruct administration to um, engage G3 and seeing what the possibility of having a tour is. Okay, in place of a meeting or do like a, I would think it'd be an addition to. Okay. More discussion? Not all in favor? Okay, that's carried. That's good. That'd be interesting. I know when the uh, a our local ASB toured the Hosting Dairy when they opened their state of the art dairy, and that was that was really informative and interesting. Okay, seven point three. Talk, ask, listen. Um, this is uh, a mental wellness workshop that goes tomorrow at the Jewel Theater in Stetler. It is put on by the Dumore Foundation. And when we were at the Provincial Ag Service Board meeting or conference in Edmonton, all the speakers, instead of speaker gifts, they got uh, donations were made in their name to the Do More Foundation. So that was really cool that that, that program is coming to our county so soon. And but and the res registration is actually closed today at five. So anybody is interested in taking this, um, I mean it's it's identify stress and how to deal with stress and things like that in agriculture. So agriculture people are welcome, it's free, and actually G3 is providing a free lunch for it, and it's tomorrow, but five o'clock today is the deadline for registry. You remember, mm -hmm. I think it was two years ago, we actually brought do more A, and we did, uh, did three, um, Workshops, I guess we hosted one here. There's us, the Flagstaff, and Camrose went together. So we did one here, one in Flagstaff, and one in Camrose. Mm -hmm. The same group of tour the well. It was, uh, we had like 100 people at each event. Yeah, they definitely do good work for sure. Okay, uh, 7.4 gravel pit reclamation. Uh, Mr. Clark, you had something. It was just uh, my only question on this is, is we have been getting these gravel pits, you know, up to the point where we should be getting our rec certificate and then we don't get the inspections done. Just on how do we approach this? How do we push? I know we need to do it from council. We need to try and get in front of the environment minister, but I'm wondering if this is something we should be taking back also to our agriculture, like the, the, the whole Alberta agriculture or fieldman, because it, it's got to be an issue for more than us as a county. Is that yeah. something you think a resolution? Sorry, I think maybe it would be a resolution. Maybe we should be putting a resolution forward for 
our next. And if you made the reason we put it, the memo into the last council package is because we, Rick and I talked about it, and RMA is coming up. Okay. We, I mean, we can definitely do one for egg services, but we're waiting until uh, November to start regional for next provincial conference. So we thought, absolutely, the way I would do it is go the egg route, but because that's so far away, and you guys typically have some meetings with Alberta Egg and or, um, sorry, Alberta Environment and whatnot. Thought maybe this avenue mm -hmm. we can we, we can try something going sooner. But we can try an RMA, but I don't. You know, we've got a we've got a meeting with infrastructure right now, but we don't. Uh, we've been trying for three years to get in in front of uh, environment. So I will, will um, if I could, but just Mr. <clears throat> Chairman, if. I mean, if, one, yeah, no, if we could going forward, we're going to be putting the same resolution basically forward anyways. So whether we write, I, I think we can do it in two folds. I think we can bring it forward in the egg service um, board, and I think we can do it as for RMA. for RMA. So when we do the RMA, we're going to find out what's going on. You see that all the time where there's two very similar <laughs> going forward. So it's not like you're going to have to reinvent the wheel, but it's going to be basically copy and paste for that next resolution. And something I can do because I know the provincial ASB committee is going to have a meeting. I don't recall if it's during RMA or just shortly after. I know Nikki is, I assume, I actually been kind of, <coughs> she's already starting a letter because of the council meeting. But if we get a hold of that letter, I can forward it to the provincial committee and they can start conversations for you guys. Because I know they meet with them soon. I, yeah. It's either at RMA or just after. That'd be a good idea. Because yeah. they'll get his ear. It's the wrong minister per se, but yeah, get it in there and maybe they can work something up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think we've got to push in as many directions as we can because we're seeing that frustration yeah. as municipalities. You know, then we push through MBC that our our gravel pit developers have to do reclamation. If they're not getting any response either, you know, we're kind of we're kind of pushing something that they're thinking. So it mustn't be important to the people on the other end. Can we do a reclamation order against ourselves and Quinton can just put it back and inspect it? <laughs> we we actually offered we've we've actually offered to bring out third party inspectors though. But well, in order to in order to inspect it, so that we could give them the paperwork that said everything's been covered off on this, and they they won't take it. We we technically have that ability with with farmers, with yeah. landowners, developers. Mr. Gender, I think it'd be a good one to bring up for the bear pit session, so that all the ministers, whoever are going to show up, are going to be made well aware of it. That's a good idea too. Yeah. And for sure. So, did you want to make any motion, Mr. Clark? Uh, to, uh, we might have a new minister by the next time around, but that's not yeah, we could. But I mean, at least he maybe I'll listen to us. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'll make a motion that we uh, get information ready to discuss the bear pit session, and uh, it it can be it will be just you know I can take okay, it. If I could yeah. make the resolution that we instruct the administration to bring or make the this resolution to instruct the administration to bring in the resolution of about two. The next ASB meeting, get it ready for the next ASB meeting. Or um, gravel pit reclamation certificate. Acceptance or acceptance inspections or, or inspections. And you know what we're saying about it, right? Yeah. Can you remind when is RMA? It's soon. R R R M A is we won't get it in. We'll get it. It's so it. I'm getting information for the bear pit as well. So okay, yeah. Well we'll do that in two separate. Just RMA is the fourteenth, but we can you know we can the other request I guess we can do through uh Nikki or something and yeah. And then the information on the bear pit session you can just yeah. give it to somebody and yeah. make that question. You know, write up the history of it. Give it to all counselors and yeah, we've got to keep it short. Yeah. yeah. How long is that thing enough? Off? We'll have the gravel guys there too. They're doing a breakout session. So the head of the gravel guys. Are they again? Yeah. They're actually at the main plenary too. It's not a breakout, I should say. Okay. So yeah, I love that, that motion. Did you get that motion? Did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Good job. Okay. All in favor of that motion. It's carried. Okay. Uh,
So the bear pit uh, piece, can that just I, be? Yeah I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to Brett and Nikki and we can, they can work with. Yeah, actually that yeah. memo that I sent in actually has the conversations back from. Well, it's like like James, James says, we have to keep it fairly short, like which we do, but at least we can say how long some of these pits have been waiting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they, they require a rework because cattle being in places. Yeah. You might have to resend that memo. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to 11.1, .1, the Provincial Ag Service Board Conference uh, report. Um, there was a few uh, members from the board that weren't able to make the the conference. Uh, Mr. Stevens actually asked me to bring back information because he was one unable to attend, and so it turned out there's quite a few that didn't make it. So I did a report, um, and I guess if there's any questions, I'd be happy to asked answer as well as anybody that was there and there were just some pieces i uh just reference to like the certified weed free forage program the edd maps the clean farm transition and all those things um i'm sure if there if you want more on these pieces uh, i'm sure quentin could uh bring back more at a future asb meeting if there's anything you want to pull out of my report that you want follow up on, I'm sure it's, it could be arranged. But. Just in the interest of time, maybe if anybody does have anything, they could email Quentin and bring it back. <clears throat> yeah, I guess anybody, I guess once you get a chance to go through the report one more time, if there's anything that you think this ASB should follow up on, maybe, by all means. Maybe send it out to all of you guys maybe. with me, and then I don't know if it will ask for the same thing. Yeah, makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Then I'll give you a motion to receive that for information, Mr. Chairman. Okay, okay Mr. Edward moves. All in favor? Carried. The next meeting is uh, scheduled for March 23rd. And that should go. There should be no problems with that one. We have nothing in camera today. And so we need uh, someone to move for adjournment. Move for adjournment. Mr. Clark adjourns. All in favor? And carried.